This is Dr. Stan here at Radio Liberty, coming to you from the hills overlooking beautiful and picturesque Monterey Bay and, and bringing you the news behind the news, the story behind the story, hoping to convince you that reality is usually scoffed at, illusion was usually king. But in the battle for the survival of Western civilization, it's going to be reality, not illusion or delusion, that will determine what the future will bring. And I need to remind you the views expressed here are not necessarily those of the owners, management, staff, sponsors, or supporters of the station you're listening to. They happen to be my views. And this evening, they're going to be the views of, uh, of Robert Bennell, and we're going to be talking about theosophy. Now, certainly, I've been studying what's going on in the world for over 50 years. And for the first 30 years of uh, my 20 years of my study, I, I had an uneasy feeling I was missing something. I mean, so many things going on in the world just didn't make sense. And then in the early 1980s, I came into contact with a woman who introduced me to this idea of theosophy and the so-called New Age movement, uh, a group of people who have a different world outlook. And we've studied this not to the degree I might have, but uh, I certainly uh, well aware it's here. And these ideas involving countless numbers of people in key positions in our society can trace their origin back to the ancient philosophers. Many of the ancient philosophers embrace these ideas and Certainly, these carry through to many of the key people in society today. And certainly, Mr. Bennell is, uh, the, has been the president in the past of the Long Beach Theosophical Society. He's written extensively on theosophy. And he was kind enough to come on and uh, agree to talk a little bit about the theosophical beliefs. So I want our listeners to hear what he has to say. It may certainly be things that you'll find difficult to understand. But I want you to understand that there are people people who believe these things with all their hearts. Most of them are very sincere. And basically, of course, we can trace this from uh, Helena Petrovna Blavatsky to Alice Bailey to uh, Manly P. Hall, and now, of course, into the 21st century, Mr. Bennell. Mr. Bennell, thank you so much for being with us tonight. All right, thank you for having me. Well, why don't you just, uh, get, could you explain to our listeners the, the philosophy of theosophy? How is it different than uh, conventional uh, uh, concepts, and uh, why do you believe that the, the, our concepts of disease are certainly not accurate? Uh, say that again, please. I beg your pardon? Could you state that again? I didn't hear you, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. I, 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 are you hearing me all right? Yes, now I can. All right, fine. Well, basically, uh, what what is theosophy? How does it differ from conventional uh, thought and philosophy? And where does it have its origin? Well, its origin always was. <laughs> In other words, it's part of what's known as the perennial philosophy or the ancient wisdom, which has always been as long as man has been on the earth, uh, we have had uh, esoteric philosophy in form or some form or another. Uh, the modern-day Theosophical Society, the rebirth of it, I might say, or the uh, renaissance of it, occurred uh, in 1875 when uh, Blavatsky, William Quan Judge, and Colonel Alcott founded the society in an organized manner in 1875, New York City. However, it's always been around in the air, so to speak, but what Bovatsky did is she gave it, a, and, and we might say an order, a spoken word. It's been around, the Indians had it to some extent, other people have had it, Emerson had it, and the New England Transcendentalists, but she gave it a little different form in the sense of the written word with her great work, The Secret Doctrine. Well, now, basically, uh, would the, can you trace these ideas back to uh, Prometheus and to Aristotle and, uh, and to Socrates? Uh, would, would those be their philosophy as well, do you think? Uh, more so Plato. He was more of an esotericist than uh, Aristotle. Socrates more a uh, humanist. But uh, I would say of that three group you mentioned, or I mentioned, 
uh, Plato would be the main, uh, let's say, theosophical figure at that time. And of course, when you go to college, why first thing a uh, primary philosophy one A was one of the only requirement we had. Were we required to read Plato? And of course, at sixteen years old, going to college, I had no idea what I was writing or reading. I had no idea what he was saying. But I this is the first introduction to these ideas well, that really are introduced to a, a large number of college students. But I don't think most of them really have any idea what they're what they're really reading. Do you have? Do would you concur with that? Uh, yes, I would. In order to understand the theosophical teachings, that has to be preceded by an initiation, we might say, or initiatory experience to open you up to the reality of the inner world. It requires something before the understanding can come. In other words, we believe so that we can understand but turned around, we might say you have to stand, understand before you can believe. But what we pursue is largely intuitive. In other words, not so much the intellect. As Whitehead at Harvard said, intuition reveals the truth. Reason relates it. Well, our world is more governed by reason, and in a sense that cancels out the intuitive impulse. But in our work as theosophists, we rely a lot upon the intuitive impulse. And then reason follows that. And so from your point of view, our reason comes from intuition rather than the other way around. Yes. Yeah. The subjective becomes first over the objective. That's why so few people along with this because they haven't had that experience what well, what made you uh, uh, embrace this philosophy I saw in your uh, biography that you attended a Christian college and so you obviously rejected Christianity embraced the theosophy what was appealing to you as far as theosophy was concerned more so than Christianity yeah well I would find a lot of things in Christianity agree with the theosophical point of view but to me, the Bible is largely symbolic, and rather than, uh, in fact, I'm right reminded you, I thought this might come up, so I have here an article that was written in the Long Beach paper. This hold that thought, hold that thought for just a moment here, and we'll be right back. Okay. Well, this is Dr. Stan, and Robert was simply saying that certainly the uh, the philosophy which we consider today theosophy was probably a very closely related to the ideas put forward by Plato, much more so than the ideas put forward by Socrates or Aristotle. But basically, of course, this whole thing comes from the fact that uh, certainly oh, the everything is based on intuition. Certainly, uh, and uh, to the average individual today, why we have reason and then we have intuition but of course uh, from the theosophist point of view they have their intuition and that becomes the foundation of their reason would that be a fair assessment yes i'd say so all right fine well basically then uh, and chris uh, uh, robert was actually uh, originally went to a christian uh, college and then he went on to got his advanced degree he practiced as a chiropractor for many years uh, but he, now of course he embraces and writes extensively on theosophy so basically what was it about christianity that you rejected and why did you embrace theosophy and suddenly oh and, and how is a theosophy almost a mere image of Christianity well let me say this about Christianity we see it as a as symbolically now we don't take it literally now this article I'm mentioning I got from the paper the headline this is attended by looks like two or three thousand priests and the Pope is sitting right in the middle of all of this and it says Catholics don't take the Bible literally well, that's exactly what we believe. We don't take it literally. And he's, uh, the man who wrote this is saying it's largely symbolic, and you do not, shouldn't take it literally. So that's our position, because everything is symbolic. As Emerson said, everything in the world is a symbol. 
everything. Well, then, if the Bible is not uh, certainly a, a, a factual book, where does reality come from? Where do facts come from? How do we know what truth is? Through the intuition. A feeling we have. In other words, if we have a feeling that something is true, and that then becomes becomes truth. And that's what you go with. Whatever your intuition reveals to you is truth. That you accept until something maybe in a latter time replaces it. But uh, that's that's what moves people forward spiritually is the intuition. And this is really all based upon spirituality, isn't it? Yes, it is. Now, basically, well, how prevalent is theosophy? In other words, certainly I am reading some of the articles there. You were talking about how Eugene Debs, who is actually one of the founders of our major labor movement, to modern day labor movement, had come to theosophy. But how many of the philo- philosophers, how many of the, yes. the leading of, of politicians, the leaders of our country, would you say are really, of course, disciples of yes. the theosophical philosophy? Uh, well, that's difficult to answer, but uh, Henry Wallace was a theosophist, too. I, I know he was, right. And uh, it's uh, it's hard to describe our position uh, as far as the consciousness goes. All I can say is it just comes upon you. In other words, it's almost a matter of faith. Uh, in a sense, faith is unknown knowledge. Faith, the definition of faith, it's just knowledge that is not known intellectually, but you have a feeling about it or a sense about it. And when I came into theosophy, I just had a feeling. I didn't have to fight it. I hadn't hadn't tried to understand it intellectually. I just kind of accepted it. It came that way. And that's the best way. Well, now, basically, of course, you've uh, written a number of articles on disease, and from uh, your point of view, uh, coming out of chiropractics, you really believe, of course, the disease as we know it, as it has been misinterpreted, the disease is not a physical uh, entity at all. It's not related to the body. It's related to sort of a response. To the, would that be a, a, a fair analysis? Well, I feel my... Uh, but my feeling about disease is that it's never caused on the physical plane. The cause of disease is higher up. We feel the manifestation of it on the lower plane, but never the cause is on the lower plane. That's why medical science really and I find the cause of disease because they're looking where it doesn't exist. You know? I mean, all the world can be is the plane of effects, never the plane of causes. Causes are above it, what Aristotle called first cause. That's where everything emanates from. And it manifests as disease, which is nothing but a a, a disharmony among body parts and uh, functions of the body and the metabolism and so forth. Well, then, what about the treatment? What about what doctors or what about what chiropractors do for disease? Well, they attempt to treat it, but never successfully, I would say. Uh, One disease might appear to be cured, but then another one appears. So uh, that's just the way it goes. And we never really get... I mean, it's it's, uh, paramount for disease to be a part of our culture at this time. It always will be on this level until we outgrow it. It's something we'll outgrow. You think that though we will outgrow disease eventually? Uh, not on this plane, but in a higher plane or a higher state of consciousness. Now, basically, yeah. of course, you emphasize in your writings the importance of this higher state of consciousness. The, what we uh, certainly uh, lust after and uh, what we want to have is this higher state of consciousness because we live in a different plane. You, you almost uh, infer that there are two uh, realms of reality, a true reality, a higher plane, and then the one we live in. Would that be a fair analysis? Yes, it would. Yes, it would. We call that plane, uh, actually we have a Sanskrit term. Many of the philosophical terms come from Sanskrit because it's found in Tibetan Buddhism is the original source of theosophy. And uh, it would be referred to by a Sanskrit name called the Atmabodhimanas. That is the higher man. What, uh, what Cahill Gibran, are you familiar with? He's the prophet. 
Now, do you look? To, uh, do you accept the fact there is a God, a supreme being, or is this sort of a sort of oneness that you describe? Uh, I would say it's the oneness. It's the eternal now. That to me is what God is. Not an individual or a person or somebody sitting on a throne up in heaven, but it's the divine essence in life. All right, now, Chris, uh, then uh, as we bring this down and apply it to what goes on on earth here, Chris, I can remember you mentioned Henry Wallace was a theosophist. I remember when Henry Wallace was running for the president of the United States back in, I think, 1947 or 48 there when I was certainly in college. And, and basically, of course, uh, we've, I think we've had a theosophist in key positions in government through the years uh, that have had a profound impact on the course of society. Would you agree or disagree with that? I would agree. And basically, can you name any of these people, or would you feel free to name them? Uh, I'd have to give that some thought as to where they were. And uh, and uh, some of them are rather mystical figures that appeared and made their influence in a certain ways. Like Comte Saint-Germain would be one that appeared and then disappeared and they have a rather mystical entrance into the world scene. Yeah, but they have their influence, and they do certain things which change the course of history. But it would be difficult to to uh, name them, really. But they are there, and from your point of view, there's no question that they have been, and they've been in key positions. Would that be a fair assessment? Yes, it would be. And because those uh, listeners, people who listen to our programs, know we've named many of these people down through the years key figures in not only American politics, but figures throughout the world who have done things that just certainly don't make sense from our point of view, uh, from the right. rational Christian point of view. But from their point of view, it really does. Now, how do certainly uh, people in theosophy feel about this necessity of establishing this one world government so that we can certainly have have a certainly serenity and peace here on earth. Well, I would say that they don't they don't get involved in any type of governmental activity really, so I wouldn't have an answer to that. All they can kind of do is kind of help where they can and just let things be as they are. Because we do have what's known as a world karma. You're familiar with that term. Oh, yes, I am. Yeah. Good for our listeners out there. Could you explain to them what the world karma is? Because remember, we're talking to people who haven't read uh, the, 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 the theosophical writing. What is world karma? What is this concept of karma, which uh, this is sort of an Indian term, but it's basically what Gandhi and the others would have talked about. And yet, because Gandhi was deeply involved with theosophy, wasn't he? He was a member of the society briefly, yes. And most people don't understand that, but of course he was certainly this great uh, Indian leader, had a profound impact upon the uh, the independence in, of of, uh, of India, breaking its ties to the to the British Empire. So basically, what is karma? What is this relationship that we speak of when we speak of uh, having a good karma? Everything we have and as we are is the result of something that happened in our past. That is the cause. What we are feeling is the effect. So we live in a world of effects. But everything has its cause. Karma is cause and effect. It's the ebb and the tide, the positive and the negative of life. We live in a world of dualities. Karma is the interaction, interaction between these dualities. We make mistakes. We learn from our mistakes. Live and learn. That's karma. And basically, of course, would this be have something to do with our relationship between uh, this other plane that we you speak of, this this superior plane, and then, of course, the plane uh, or the uh, the level uh, uh, that we live in, uh, this uh, spiritual level we live in? Would that uh, certainly be part of that? Yes. Now, what do you seem to grasp an understanding of all of this? 
I can tell by your questions. Well, I, I've studied it, uh, Robert. I, I think it's fascinating. and You're the first uh, theosophist I've ever had a chance just to sit down and talk to. <laughs> oh, well, we're going to be back here in just a moment with Robert Bennell. We'll be talking about this. I think it's vitally important to understand there are well-meaning people who really believe this. Robert does. We'll be back in a moment here. Well, well, this is Dr. Stan. I guess is Robert Bennell, who is a theosophist, and so he's one of the leading people writing about theosophy. And basically, certainly, this certainly permeates every aspect of our society today. And yet, most people certainly really do not grasp what's going on. Now, is there any relationship between, say, theosophy and Rosicrucianism, or city masonry, or any of these other organizations? Yeah, all connected. They're all on the same side of the fence, so to speak. And I think it's, it's very important. In fact, Madame Blavatsky was a contemporary of Albert Pike, who is the great uh, um, Masonic writer of another era. Would that be a fair statement? Sure. And so was Manley Hall, you know. In fact, right, he was a 33rd degree Mason. Now, basically, yeah. of course, then what is, what, how are all these things collected? And, uh, and, uh, and what way, uh, how do these things interlock with one with the other? Because these, certainly, Masonry has had a profound impact upon uh, America, key people in the Supreme Court having been Masons and have changed the course and direction of our society. How does this all fit together? Could, could you uh, delve into that for us? Yeah, they all said the same thing in little different ways. And the main proposition is where were the law of cause and effect, which is karma. They all believed in the lie and the re-embodiment, or what's popular known as reincarnation. And they all believed in the the absolute, that there's one point above us or within us, it is absolute and complete, and everything flows from that point, and there are no exceptions. Now, that's difficult. That's what's known as abstract reasoning, and that is difficult. Most people would have a hard time with abstract reasoning, because and the uh, righteousness of circumstance. These things all fit into the, we could call it the platonic philosophy if we want we could call it the theosophical philosophy, whatever. They're all connected, and they're all stating really the same thing in a little different way, really. But what are they basically stating? What are they basically stating? Right, or no, there's basically, you say they're all stating the same thing, but what are they stating? Are they simply pointing to this oneness that joins us all together? Yes, the oneness is what joins us all together. What happens to you can happen to me. What happens to somebody living over in uh, Finland can happen to me. In other words, all affected, and that's called world karma. We're all in this, we're all in this together. And uh, as Gil Brown said in his book, for instance, no one commits a crime without the hidden will of you all. In other words, we're, all in, we're even involved in that. Something like crime, which is very distant to most of us, in, but in a peculiar, metaphysical, abstract way, we are somehow... Hold that thought. Uh, hold that thought. Well, Dr. Stan, I, I'm sorry we had to take a break there, but of course we have to do that. Uh, but sure. But, but basically, I want to repeat what Robert was saying. He says, of course, that there's an interrelationship between theosophy and Rosicrucianism and masonry, and they all simply are pointing in the same direction. In fact, as we pointed out earlier, Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, so-called Madame Blavatsky, who is really the person who established the, uh, the Theosophical Society, who was very close to Albert Pike, who wrote the classic uh, book, uh, Morals and Dogma, the, the background of uh, modern-day masonry. And basically, of course, as he points out, the Masons and the Theosophists and the Rosicrucianism already share a common uh, philosophy. Now, you correct me if I have any of this wrong. Don't be bashful, Robert. But uh, so I don't want to put words in your mouth. But there is this this idea that we're all oneness, and basically, that basically, we are all bound together by the same karma. And when one, one person commits a crime, it impacts on all of us. And when one person does good, it impacts on all of us. Would that be a fair statement? Yes. And I'll make 
take one little aphorism here from Kabir, the great Hindu poet, who said, Behold the one in all things is the second that leads you astray. Now that, when you get into the seconds of the dualities of life, you're getting away from the oneness, and that's where the trouble starts. When we lose sight of the unity of things, and basically, most people don't understand the prevalence of these thoughts. I mean, here at one time we had four million uh, uh, Masons in America. Now we probably have two million. Now, does the average Mason understand all this? No. But there certainly is, as Mandy P. Hall said, a, a Masonry within a Masonry, and the leaders of Masonry understand this. The average Mason simply becomes a Mason because, of course, well, they get, they get ahead in the world, and uh, they do a lot of good, and they of needs, uh, they help uh, help uh, crippled children, but certainly uh, when you get into the forces at the upper echelons of masonry, you begin to understand how this is all part and parcel of a world movement intent upon changing the world. And of course, uh, at one time, our Supreme Court was uh, certainly dominated by the Masons, and they were the ones that took God and prayer and the Ten Commandments out of our schools, because of course they did not want that taught in our schools. In fact, I believe, of course, they wanted a different uh, society. And, to, to, and uh, certainly they have created a far different society just 50 years ago is when this all began. Then at that point, why the Supreme Court totally dominated by my Masons who have a different world view. So basically, what sort of world does the Theosophist want? How will we have a better society uh, as the, the Theosophical influence spreads across a, a nation? Uh, I would say that the world does not improve. Now, that's a radical statement. But the world's like the fourth grade in school. No matter what you do, it's always going to be the fourth grade. You can maybe change it a little bit, but it's still between the fifth and the third. It'll always be the fourth grade. Our world will always be what it is. Now, it may appear to be get better in certain areas, but in other places, get worse. So it all balances out, and we really don't get anywhere. But here's the important point philosophically. As we try to change it and improve it, we get better. We improve ourselves. Like in a gym, you go in not to, not to change the weight or to change the machine, but it changes you, you see? And that's a very important point. It's kind of a radical position, but when you think about it and contemplate it, it turns out to be true that all of these things make us better people in trying to do it, but we don't necessarily expect the world to change. Well, you know, Chris, when I was growing up, and I was growing up in the 1950s and uh, and going to college, 19, I guess graduated from uh, college in 1940, but this was an entirely different world at that time. Certainly, I think the moral values of our society were better. The human compassion of our society was better. We didn't have all of these government programs, and but certainly during this last uh, 50 years or more, America's changed. Do you think America's changing for the better or for the worse? Uh, I'd say it stays about the same. You, know, you really don't think that we're any worse off than we were, say, uh, uh, 50 or 60 years ago? Well, in certain ways we are, and in certain ways we're better. So when you put the two together, it is about the same. Well, see? How, are, how are we better? How is America a better society today than we were, say, 60 years ago when I was uh, going to college? Well, I'd say war is a little more humane than it used to be. I would say uh, treatment of disease and sickness is more effective. It doesn't get rid of it, but it's more effective. I would say we have a little more compassion in certain ways. But when I say this, I can see the opposite is happening, too. Hold that thought. Our guest is Robert Bennell, uh, who is a, a theosophist. We'll be back in just a moment here at Radio Liberty. Well, this is Dr. Stan, I guess, is Robert Pinnell, who for many years was the president of the Los Angeles chapter, of the, uh, pardon me, Long Beach chapter of the Theosophical Society. Are you still active in your local Theosophical Society, Robert? Yeah, I'm still the president. I've been the president for 40 years, okay. for the most part. 
Okay, fine. Now, would, you, would you mind taking a, a question from the audience, or would you rather not? Oh, it doesn't matter. I can do that. All right, fine. If you're out in the audience, you have a question for Robert. I don't want people calling in debating Robert. Uh, we want to get the information he has. Uh, and basically, so if you have a question, a legitimate question for him, our telephone number is one triple eight two four liberty one triple eight two four liberty or four six four eight two nine five. Now, how do you feel about, say, uh, America as a nation? Uh, how do you feel about this idea, certainly, of, of uniting certainly the, the world together into some a common brotherhood. Where does theosophy fit into this idea of a one world government? Oh, well, if we believe in that, if it can be brought about. But when we consider the many factions that are included in the world scene, uh, it's highly unlikely that that would happen. But it's an ideal, and we can always aspire to ideals. They're one of the things that purify us. So, uh, all theosophists are idealists, we might mention. All of them are idealists. I'm, sh I'm sure they are. Now, what about these ideas of socialism and basically the go government providing for the people, which are these increasingly prevalent ideas in our society? Uh, basically, of course, uh, some of us uh, adhere to the Constitution, or we think that this, uh, the, uh, any effort to take care of people and help people should be done purely at the local level. We fear uh, the federal government, would, uh, if having power to help people, would eventually end up controlling them, and would use that power to its own advantages. But how would the theosophists feel about this, moved away from the Constitution towards a more socialist America in a socialist world? I would say that is more fair, considering everything. I would say it's more uh, spiritual, in a sense. But uh, it would go against the capitalistic concept and I think that would not allow it to take place but as far as the philosophy why the theosophists would embrace it although you don't think that it is going to take place would that be a fair assessment no, I would say that's true All for right. the most part all right, fine. Uh, now, if you're out there in the listening audience, we have Jim calling from Michigan. We'll get to Jim in just a moment. Do you have a website or anything that you'd like to put out for our listeners? If you'd like no, to I read? don't have a website. All right, well, and you... the philosophical site, he doesn't have one either. It does at the national headquarters but not locally here. However, you can go up and Google and just type in Robert Pinnell and uh, Sydney uh, Theosophy, or and, uh, you'll get many of his articles there. We have Jim calling from, from Michigan. Jim, do you have a question or comment for our guest? Yes, yes, I sure do. I'm listening to a Christian radio station right now, so I need to ask your... Um, well, but, but I don't want to argue of uh, uh, Christianity. Uh, no just argument. A philosophy. No go argument. Ahead, go ahead. <laughs> Yes, yes. Um, what does uh, theosophy, um, where does Jesus come into play, and do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? All right, that's a very legitimate question, Jim. Yeah. I, uh, once again, incidentally, our telephone number is one triple eight two four liberty, one triple eight two four liberty, or four six four eight two nine five. And where does Jesus come in, uh, to the uh, theosophical uh, beliefs, uh, and where does he fit into uh, certainly uh, society as it exists today, and into the history of what's unfolded in the past? Uh, unfortunately, uh, with many, Jesus, with the auspice, Jesus is a myth, mythical figure. The important thing in the whole Jesus idea is the importance of the Christ. Not so much Jesus, the personality, but the Christ as a, as a, uh, no, basically, you do not believe Jesus was a real figure. He believes is symbolic, and that, and basically, he is a sort of an impersonation of this the, the Christ. In other words, a spiritual figure rather than Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Would that be a fair assessment? I would say that's true. But it's very important. I don't mean to put down Christianity. Now, the importance of the Christ is very important. It's something.
anything we can aspire to. All right, would you explain to our to Jim, because uh, I think this is very important, the Christ, not Jesus Christ, but the Christ is a pivotal figure in, in this whole theosophical uh, philosophy, Jim. And remember, uh, this is a Christian station. I happen to be an evangelical Christian, as you know. But I think it's important that we understand that there's this movement out here. Certainly, uh, the one of the gentlemen, Henry Wallace, who uh, uh, Robert has mentioned, well, came very, very close to being the uh, president of the United States. He was the vice president uh, under uh, uh, FDR. He would have been president had it not been that uh, uh, that. Uh, they ran uh, Harry Truman instead of uh, 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 Henry Wallace in, uh, for the president's vice presidency uh, in the year 19, I guess it was 1944. But uh, basically, of course, you have to understand that this is, uh, no, I thought it had been, uh, I, I, I'm, I stand corrected, it was in 1940. But basically, uh, there have been many, many theosophists in key positions in our government and throughout the world. I just want you to understand where they're coming from. But go right ahead. You were talking about the Christ. Go ahead. Well, the term Christ means the anointed. And every, every religion, every religious movement has a Christ. But it's called something else. But it represents the whole of things. It represents everything we can be. It's the great potential. And when we worship, we should be worshiping not so much the personality called Jesus. Jesus come and go, but the Christ is eternal. It's something that's always there, always has been, always will be. So the Jesus of the world can come and go, but not the Christ. And the thing that made Jesus important is because he embraced the Christ consciousness. And basically, I would say that almost every religion has a Christ figure, but only right. Christianity has Jesus Christ. So basically, there are just two uh, alternatives. One is Jesus Christ, and then the other is the, all the others. That they, they all, uh, from a Christian point of view, we are a unique religion because we're the only one who looks to Jesus Christ. All the others have a Christ figure, but I said they, they reject Jesus Christ, and the theosophists do as well. Anything else, Jim? No, that'll be about it. Thank you, Dr. Stanley. Thank you so very much for calling here. And uh, our telephone number again is one triple eight two four liberty or four six four eight two nine five here in the Central Coast of California. And Robert, uh, would you uh, agree or disagree with uh, at least my interpretation of that? Uh, no, I would agree with that. All right, basically, of course, you do not accept Jesus Christ as the Messiah, or the Son of God, but that is the Christian belief. We've got John. not the one and only. Right. Oh, and basically, uh, we have John calling from Spokane. John, do you have a question or comment? Um, well, I've got both, if you don't mind. Um, one was I heard a lecture uh, on YouTube, and somebody was interviewing uh, I forget the guy's name, and he was he, one of the questions he said was, "Why is Madame Blavatsky so vilified?" And um, his answer was, "It's because people have never read any of her books." And so um, I wanted to find out what is really going on, and the, and the way to know is to read somebody's book. Be like the way to understand Christianity would be to read the Bible. And so um, I read it, and one of the things that she one of the things she refers to. Uh, as these these ascended masters, and uh, but she specifically refers to Jesus as an ascended master. All right, Not that I, I, I think this is an important point. Well, let's just go ahead and uh, suddenly. Uh, uh, so that was my question. Okay. My but, question is, um, is but is she she said. I mean, it was as if this person was not a concept. Jesus was not a concept. He was a real person. And that ascended masters are sent here to get us back on the track. And there have been many, and Jesus was one of them, is what she said. All right, I think that's a very legitimate point, and you're absolutely right. I'm glad you took the time to read Madame Blavatsky. I read her, and I'll tell you what, well, uh, we won't talk about uh, my feeling after having read that, but you're absolutely right. And uh, Sidney Robert, Sidney, our guest, uh, uh, John, calling from Spokane, Washington, talks about having read Madame Blavatsky, read about the ascended masters, and that Jesus was one of the 
those who said his masters in other words Jesus was not simply a, a, a ethereal figure but it was a real individual sent here uh, to work uh, with uh, Sydney in this uh, with the world to improve it is that a fair assessment yes and the reason he was the ascended master is because at the time he participated in the Christ consciousness that's what made him an ascended master not because he was Jesus but because he was the ascended master because of her, his participation in the higher consciousness, which we call the Christ, of which we all have within us, by the way. All right, fine. Anything else, uh, anything else John, you'd like to ask? Um, the other thing was that, um, that her main interest was research and that there was discord in the early times of theosophy and that when the Fabian Socialists came in and started uh, uh, dominating the whole thing politically, this was very upsetting to her, and shortly after that, she died. And some things seemed to think that her death was the result of the upsets that were being caused by the Fabian Socialists. I'd like to get Robert's comment on that. I would say that's not a reason she passed away. She passed away because of her time. I believe from the day we're born, the time is established when we're going to die. And that's the reason she died, is because it was time for her to pass on. But there was a certain amount of strife, strife she suffered from because seeing the Theosophical Society split up in different directions from what, we, what she had intended. And I'm sure that is disappointing to her. But I don't think it was her reason for discarnating. That's how we call death, discarnating. And so she didn't die, she discarnated. Okay, John, thank you very much. Anything else you wanted to ask before we let you go? Um, when he was talking about intuition and, and this type of thing, would you say that that would be the same thing as a knowingness yes. as opposed to a thinkingness? Yes. Um, it's a Gnostic principle. Okay. Gnostic principle of knowingness, but not intellectualized. The intellect figures it out after the idea comes down to our level. And basically, of course, uh, John, it's all based, it's not based upon rationality, it's based upon these thoughts and ideas that supposedly come from a supernatural source. Hey, thanks very much for calling, John, and I'm glad there are people out there who have done the reading and research to understand it. And, of course, uh, I hope that you have not changed your philosophy. I hope you still worship our Lord. But God bless. Thanks very much. Let's quickly go to Connie, who's calling us from Washington State. Connie, do you have a question or comment for our guest? Um, a couple questions, if that's okay. Right. Go ahead. Okay. Thanks for having him on, Dr. Stan. I, I have studied about Madame Bl Blavatsky in this for quite a long time. Um, uh, are, are, you coming from, are you coming from a Christian point of view, or are you a theosophist? Yes. You're coming no, from no, a Christian, Christian point of view. I figured if you're listening to yes. this radio station, you're probably coming from a Christian point of view, but <laughs> I think it's vitally important that we understand what is going on in the world today. And you can't understand unless you understand what Robert is saying. But what, go right ahead, Connie. I totally agree, Dr. Stan. I think it's a very important issue, and I've tried to tell a lot of people that they need to study about her and, and her they, philosophy. They probably all think you're crazy, but go right ahead. <laughs> yeah, they do. Okay, yeah, I want to know, was the UN started by theosophists? Because I, I've kind of been uh, researching, and I've been really wondering about that. All right, fine. And the question is, wait a minute, one question at a time. Oh, sorry. What okay. part does the uh, United Nations play, or what part does theosophy play in the formation of the United Nations back in 1945? I would say it was a theosophical impulse, although I can't name the figures, that it instigated the United Nations because that very important body has helped done a job in keeping the world together. All right. Yeah, and, uh, and very significant, yeah. the United Nations. Okay, Connie, next question. Okay, and do, who are some famous theosophists? Well, we mentioned Henry Wallace. We mentioned, uh, oh gosh, I can't think of that. 
Oh, okay. Uh, Connie, what you need to do is get my book, Brotherhood of Darkness, and read it. And we give you a a large number of these people, key people in every aspect of society. Have you read my book? I had it for for a time from a friend. He let me borrow it, but I had to give it back. Yes, Well, you've got a copy. Or if you don't want to (laughs) invest in one, go to my website, RadioLiberty.com. Scroll down to videos on the web and watch it. It's a talk I gave. The book came from the talk, not the talk from the book. Okay, God bless. Oh, great. Thank you so much. Okay, fine. Let's go to Joe's calling us from the new... Joe's calling from New Jersey. Joe, do you have a question for our guest? Well, I have basically... Uh, no, just a question. I don't want to, don't want to debate. Well, well, no, I don't, I'm not going to get into, I'm not get into any kind of uh, scriptural uh, uh, references, but I, I would have to uh, disagree well, with you. Joe, 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 we specified we did not want to have to agree. If you have a question, fine. But otherwise, we do have other people. Well, then how does, he, how does he... Well, okay, i got a question. Then how does he explain all the prophecies of this one to come in Scripture? Okay, fine, okay. Okay, 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 then we'll ask the question. Uh, how would you, uh, 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 how would you, of course, then address the... Joe is calling us from New Jersey. Joe, do you have a question for our guest? Are you there, Robert? Yes. Uh, basically, Joe asked, uh, what about the biblical prophecies? And the biblical prophecies seem to be coming true. What? How would you respond to that? I would say that the prophecy, as it appears to come true, it is, uh, that happens, prophecy, yes. Okay, fine, let's go to Carol, who's calling us from Spokane, Washington. Carol, do you have a question or comment? Um, I guess I have a comment, okay. or it could be considered a question. Um, earlier in the program, it was talked about truth and about something true being replaced later, which I just kind of don't understand if something's true, really true, what it can be replaced with. Maybe he could just talk about what that all meant, and I'll just hang up and he can talk. All right, fine. Basically, Chris, you were talking about these ideas of of basically a truth, but this really would come from this sort of karma. Would that be correct? What would truth be in a theosophist? A truth is defined by Gandhi, of all people, is self-evident. When you come upon a truth, you know it to be true. Now, you can't prove it to anybody. You can't disprove it. That's the nature of metaphysics. You can't prove it. You can't disprove it. This is how you feel about it. That is truth. When it comes upon you, you will know it. You will know it. All right, fine. Well, our guest has been Robert Bennell, and we're going to be back here in just a moment to wrap up our program. We've got a little short break here, and we'll be right back. I'm cloud Well, this is Dr. Stan, I guess Ben Robert Bennell. We've got three minutes, Robert. What is the parting thought you'd like to leave with our listeners for this evening so they would be better understand your philosophy and why you've chosen this uh, as a, this foundation of your religious beliefs? I say the main thing is that it makes sense. It makes sense to me, the theosophical perspective of absolute law, righteousness, and circumstance. That is a difficult thing for the world to accept, because we're saying that no matter what happens, there's a righteousness about it. And that can be a dangerous position. That's why one of the things, one of the tenets, is the courage to face the truth. And that allows us to see the whole picture. You don't understand the picture if you can just see the corner of it. You have to see the whole picture, then the corner makes sense. Well, it's the same way we have to look at the world. We have to see the whole picture, past, present, and possible future. Well, now, but let me uh, just uh, uh, ask the question, if, if, we're, if everything that is would fit into that category, how would you explain the Nazi movement and what happened to the fate of the Jews? How would that fit into this worldview? Out of it came something good. That's all I can say. Does anything good come out of tragedy or mishaps? Does any good come out of it? Then that's the that's the reason it happened because of the good that comes out of it. 
All right, well, I want you to know how much I really appreciate you being with us and uh, your, your willingness to share your thoughts and views. And, uh, and I'm not going to change you. You're not going to change me. But of course it, not. <laughs> it's nice to be able to have an intelligent discussion. And I, I'm uh, so pleased that our, our listeners, certainly, uh, all of them, I think, uh, certainly have behaved very well. Uh, rather than trying to challenge you and debate you, we wanted your thoughts. We wanted your ideas. And thank you very much for being with us. Perhaps we could talk again sometime. And I'll leave you with one comment. Go right ahead. Spiritual truths are not learned, they're earned. It's a yes. lifestyle that brings all this about. Spiritual truths are not learned, they're earned. Right. Uh -huh. It's all subjective. It's what you do that brings it about, not what you say. God bless and thanks very much. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Well, this is Dr. Stan, and certainly I, uh, I wondered whether we should even uh, put on the program tonight, but I think it went well. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you have some grasp. Uh, who are these people who embrace this philosophy? Well, I will tell you that Harry Truman did, Winston Churchill did. If you haven't read my book, Brotherhood of Darkness, shame on you. You need to get it. If you can't buy it, go up on the website, RadioLiberty.com, and you can uh, suddenly scroll down to the... Uh, of videos online. The Brotherhood of Darkness is the first one there. And basically it was from that talk I gave uh, that the book came. But it is the basis of some 30 years of research, 40 years of research, uh, into the background of the supernatural forces that are guiding us towards where we are today. And of course, as somebody brought out this evening, uh, certainly this movement towards one world government, the United Nations, is part and parcel of this, and Robert certainly uh, verified that. And of course, uh, certainly what most people don't want to recognize is the fact that the Nazi movement was deeply involved in the occult and certainly Himmler and many of the others were deeply involved in philosophy and theosophy and that is of course why why the CIA and MI6 which are involved in this whole world occult movement as long as as well as a satanic segment in the Vatican helped uh, between 10 and 30,000 Nazis escape to South America following World War II and I always figured the figure was 10,000 but John Loftus who had access to the, the as files in the government uh, you know, the security clearance three levels above top secret he estimated it could be as many as 30,000 you need to get his book America's Nazi Secret John's book and my interviews with him The War Against the Jews pivotal to understanding what's going on today. Now, basically he doesn't get into the theosophical movement and the occult movement within the Nazis, but this of course was motivated that movement as it motivates communism as it motivates the people in Washington, D.C. today who are pushing for world government and who are using the financial and military power of the United States to bring about a world government and of course it was the Masons on the Supreme Court all tying into this same movement as Robert pointed out who took God and prayer and the Ten Commandments out of our schools and until you begin to understand the influence of this movement nothing makes sense and this is if you question what I said about the um, um, Oh, Winston Churchill and Harry Truman, you, we have an, a, an article out of the Wall Street Journal called Bye Bye Woodrow, and it was written by Senator Arthur Schlesinger Jr., where he reiterates just what I said. You need to understand, ladies and gentlemen, we're involved in a spiritual battle for the souls of men, and we must understand what we believe in, and then we must understand those who embrace the other philosophy. Uh, many of them do not understand the true nature of this, but truly we're in trouble today, because this is what's in our schools. That's why they took God and prayer and the Ten Commandments and Christmas and Easter out of our schools. And, and why are you children fitness of education? not believing in God or family or country. If you love your kids, get out of government schools. Well, ladies and gentlemen, Sydney, if you haven't read my book, Brotherhood of Darkness, you need to get it. If you haven't heard my talk on Agenda 21, The Covert Plan, you need to get it. You need to get John Loftus's book, America's Nazi Plan, and certainly my interviews with him. 
the war against the Jews. That'll give you enough to begin with. The telephone number is 1-800-544-8927. 1-800-544-8927. Our webpage is radioliberty.com. That's RadioLiberty.com. And we do hope, of course, if you're in a position to help us financially, you will, because we want to maintain our network of stations across America and the places where we're heard, where people are learning. And all we can do is to reach the people that God gives us the opportunity. If you'd like to be part of our team, join the Radio Liberty family, our number 1-800-544-8927, our webpage, RadioLiberty.com. And then we ask you to pray for America. We ask you to pray for revival, to pray for our leaders and ministers. But please pray for Radio Liberty, our provision and our protection. 